Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third AA breakout. Um, we've had a bunch happen since the last one, and uh, hopefully we can take the time today to uh, figure out how to move forward on the spec. Um, so the two main things, um, basically, uh, that I think it is worth like an upgrade on is uh, one, the uh, PR that was made to 7702 uh, based on like some conversation between L1 client teams. Um, and then there was a workshop in Berlin um, last week. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Ansgar has a, a quick uh, recap of that. And then out of those things, I think there's still a couple open questions on the spec, which uh, I think we'll naturally discuss um, and hopefully uh, yeah, we can get to some next steps uh, based on all of this. But I guess uh, maybe to kick us off, uh, Light Clients, do you want to give just a bit of context on your PR um, and how that sort of led to the discussions in Berlin? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> um, the, the PR is kind of accumulated over the past few weeks of different, many different conversations with some different stakeholders. Uh, first, we talked with some L1 client teams at the interop to sort of gauge what types of restrictions they felt were going to be necessary. And that sort of led to a lot of the restrictions from the original proposal, adding the optional chain ID, adding the optional nonce into the signature scheme. And then in Berlin, we sort of talked about these restrictions again with some of the present uh, wallet developers. And it seemed like there was general agreement that the restrictions in place make sense. And we talked about some of the other open questions and it felt like the two things, two good takeaways and Ansgar can confirm, but two takeaways from the meeting in Berlin was that we probably would not have a flag to persist to the code uh, because we have open question still on e actual EOA migration. And the second big takeaway was we need to do more research into allowing storage for the EOAs. Obviously, it's something that people would like to see and it allows for us to use the smart contract wall implementations mostly out of the box as they are today. But there are a handful of issues um, the two notable ones are address uh, or storage s storage key collisions between wall implementations. So concerns with the application layer. And then there's some protocol concerns. We recently added a retroactive EIP, which was 7610. And that sort of disallows this behavior of having a an account in the state try that's empty other than its storage. So those are two areas we're continuing to look into. I'm happy to discuss further later in this call. Thank you. Um, and yeah, Anzar, do you want to give a quick recap of uh, your Berlin notes? Yeah, sure. So basically in Berlin, we also just talked about all the different dimensions of like, like the, the open questions around the IP. Um, we basically came down on exactly um, the version of the of this open PR uh, of, of, of meds. Of course, not all of those are necessarily have full agreement by people yet, but at least in terms of majority support. So that was specifically the, um, and so on. On the one hand, the question was how how do how do you specify the the target um, of the of the of the code uh, that that runs in your account? And so the idea for now is that you. Um, uh, specify the address, not the code. Um, you also sign over the address, not the code, um, and you don't run in in code. Uh, as Matt was saying, reaper protection chain ID non is optional. Um, for now, no storage restrictions. Um, yeah, and we dis we decided that for now we would not feel comfortable about la launching with something with something that, that looks like a permanent upgrade, like right from the beginning. I mean, obviously, the detail to be figured out is whether we already. Um, have this kind of like um, in the in the in, in the transaction, and we just for now enforce it to not be set, so that it's easier to to upgrade in the, in the future, and we don't need a new transaction type, a new signature type. But that the detail question, so basically the the, the idea would we would at least not allow for for direct 
um, permanent upgrading yet. Um, and then other than the storage pattern, which indeed, as Matt was saying, is like a big open question. I think the, the one other thing that did come out of this meeting was that we realized that it would be really important to start also working on the like some sort of wallet guidance document because I think that that even just like we had some people some someone from Ledger there for example and even just um talking about like in practice how would this be so should this be supported by Ledger for example right like that clarified a lot of questions and concerns and so um learning from 559 where I think we kind of underspecified how wallets should 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 behave with this new functionality I think it would be really good to kind of start outlining very clear rules of like what how wallets are supposed to interact with this. Yeah, I think that that's kind of the, the summary. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else have anything to add? I know there were a bunch of other people that the burden meetup. Okay, so I guess in that case, um, yeah, it might make sense to just go through basically the two um, yeah, uh, maybe, yeah, going through like the, the, the different open questions. So like uh, on the replay protection, it does seem like we were, were set. Um, on the restrictions, storage uh, still feels like the biggest question. Um, so I guess, yeah, maybe let's uh, open the floor to this. Um, how do people feel about storage? Uh, Yoav, you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I just thought, yeah, I just finished writing about it. So regarding storage, the discussion was with, with whether uh, there's a way to make it safe so that we don't have to uh, ban uh, a store. And we agreed that uh, if we if we had a standard that prevents collisions, then even if a standard where uh, each implementation uses its own uh, storage base instead of starting from zero, it could be made safe. The problem was that it's hard and required assembly code. And that's something that uh, I've been asking the Solidity team for a long time. So the update is just is that uh, I just got off a call with uh, uh, just a weekly call with the Solidity team. They understand the issue and they made it a priority to uh, to find a way to uh, find a way to set, uh, find a way for contracts to control their storage layout before uh, and uh, they understand that it has to happen before uh, Prague for 7702. So we should get them feedback. We should work with them now to agree on uh, on what it should look like in Solidity, but I think it will enable using it, it will enable a store in the EOA. Uh, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Anzar? Uh Let's do Antgard and Felix. Yeah, just very briefly say that like part of the design philosophy behind 7702 was to try to be as compatible with the existing 437 smart account ecosystem as possible. And so to the extent that storage collisions are a concern that is already present in that world, I think the idea would be to just to try to avoid ending up with two separate tech stacks. And so to leave it up to that ecosystem to figure that out, like, with, with the projects like the one just presented by you are. Of course, to the extent that concerns are beyond this equivalence um, point, um, they are still valid and we might have to address them. But basically, like, if it's just the concern around storage collisions, I think it would, would really be best to try to leave it up to the 437 ecosystem. Yeah, uh, Felix, so from yeah. my end, um, so we have been discussing last couple of days this, this, this topic quite quite typically in, in, in Geth. And um, from what I heard uh, also from Matt, this seems to be the general consensus that um, <clears throat> it is usually kind of unsafe for users to sign um, or, like any kind of like conflicting authorizations for code that could run within their EOA. So it's only really ever going to be safe to sign like a specific and very well audited proxy. And so it feels like maybe we should just only allow like that one proxy. And that would also kind of remove the possibility to like have storage conflicts for the time being. And we can like worry about storage conflicts later when we actually do allow more than 
one specific proxy to run within the context of the account. And I think that would also allow like way more time for, for example, the contract development ecosystem to like migrate to these ideas of like declaring the storage slots and because it's kind of a topic that's very new now. So, yeah, just maybe something to consider. Thanks. Um, Conrad? Um, following from, uh, up from what Ansgar was saying, um, so we, um, I can I can send the PR kind of for context afterwards, but we have a modular account, which is like a reference implementation. And kind of um, a few weeks back, we just quickly kind of tried porting over to using an external storage contract. And essentially it took like an hour and probably like 50 lines of code of change to, to pull that over. So like the effort there was pretty minimal. Like I understand that there could be some security implications in terms of like form, form of verification and stuff like that, that, that are kind of, that we should also consider, but like purely in terms of kind of pulling over an existing 437 account um, to use an external storage contract. And in, in my opinion, and based on this, like PR is, is pretty minimal effort. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Ahmad. Um, so like, uh, I just want to comment about uh, the specifying a proxy implementation uh, and only uh, allowing to sign a single authorization. Uh, so like about this, in my opinion, this same problem exists with like, even if the proxy contract, uh, you have only a single proxy contract, the proxy contract still calls delegate call. And when you use storage cells in the, smart account implementation or smart wallet implementation, then it would use the same storage cells of the EOA. So uh, regardless if you use a single proxy implementation or multiple proxy implementation, uh, the same issue still exists. And uh, this also exists for smart ac contract accounts. And I don't see why the restriction should, uh, like any restriction should be applied in this uh, manner. Of course, I do agree that auditing the proxy contracts and uh, from the wallets uh, before approving them is, is something that should be done, but uh, restricting the wallets to a single proxy implementation is not something that I would support. Uh, Felix? Yeah, I can just quickly uh, react to this and just say that I think that it's more like the difference with this proposal of only allowing specific proxy for now is also that like, for example, changing the destination of the proxy or like migrating to a different wallet type or whatever would involve an on-chain action, which is very explicit. And so it would, for example, also allow you to, if you wanted to switch from one, from one kind of wallet type to another wallet type, which can act on your behalf, you could do that by, for example, first, like, Initially, you would you would point a proxy to a one specific wallet implementation, which would set up its storage slots the way it wants to do it. And then, when you want to switch to a different wallet, you'd have to deploy some kind of temporary migration contract that like switches the storage around. And then you could go to or it clears it or whatever. And then you could, with another transaction, switch the proxy again to like the new wallet implementation you want to use or things like that. Whereas uh, with this like authorizations approach. It's like you you would be free to accidentally, for example, sign multiple conflicting authorizations for different wallets to run within your account. And if you're unlucky, these since they can be basically these authorization authorizations could potentially be used by anyone to um, run code uh, in the context of your account. Um, it means they. It's just like much more risky, basically. I think to 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 allow, because it has this this danger of not just like it's not a it's not an explicit on chain action to change like which code is the designated code to run. Uh, Ahmad, is your hands up again, or yeah, just just one comment about that is. I would have the wallets check the storage cells before having them approve a certain implementation. And if they find that these storage cells have value, they can do a transaction that clears them before authorizing the the different implementation or, or something like that. Of course, 
uh, this is just uh, theoretical. I just don't want to restrict the design space for the uh, the wallet implementers for whatever reason. It, it does not make sense to restrict the design space just for this reason. Yeah. That that's also... uh, that's my my. Yeah. So I also I also don't think we should uh, restrict the design space if we can uh, standardize storage. But uh, regarding a transaction that clears the storage, that wouldn't be practical for wallets because they would need to trace. Since especially with Verkel, you have no way to enumerate the storage, so you would have to uh, go through all the transactions and not just for EO, for this EOA, but every transaction because it can be a different EOA using seven seven zero two to change storage slots. So you would need to trace every transaction that ever touched this EOA and trace the storage slots that were written. Um, so no, I... so so you don't need to clear all storage. You need to only clear the storage that your specific implementation uses. So like um, in that uh, way, with mapping, with mapping, it becomes impossible because it's catch up mm. of something. So for example, it could be a sign like in the in the case uh, that I like to point out with a uh, with safe. So safe has a mapping of owners. And if you have if you have one written in some high slot, you don't know whether it's a shadow or whether it's going to end up a, an additional owner in your account. Yep, 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 yep. You're right. You're right. Okay. Um not quite sure where we've landed here. Um, is, yeah, I guess. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to think through like, do we think it makes sense to uh, remove the, the store capability? And yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I guess. So one way you know to think about this as well is if we think there's a risk around allowing it, um, this is slightly more work on the protocol side, but we could also fit the EIP with the storage uh, like S store not enabled and then potentially in a future hard fork activate it. Um, one risk around this is just in the meantime, the ecosystem sort of develops around this. Um, yeah, come on. Um, so I would not prevent a store instead i would allow a store and then at the end of the transaction clear the storage slots that were written the reason is to keep compatibility as high as possible for all the smart contracts that are using a slow the store possibly even for counters or something like that um and then like right. yeah so i would not prevent the whole opcode and so basically, S store would act kind of like T store does. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so that's. Uh, I mean, if and I don't think we should. Uh, I mean, it seems that uh, we shouldn't ban the opcode, but I would definitely wouldn't want to make it behave like T store because the developer of the contract was not aware that uh, this storage actually becomes uh, ephemeral. And could be it could have interesting uh, okay, mm -hmm. unintended con consequences where parts of the transaction modify the storage in other contracts and part of them uh, didn't. For example, suppose you are setting the threshold for your uh, safe implementation, but now the threshold goes back or uh, you change size yeah, and yeah. it doesn't actually happen. So uh, if it's if it's T store, let's just use T store and ban uh, ban S store. But I don't think we should change. Yeah, change the semantics. Got it, uh, Ansgar. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, in, in, not on this te temporary point, but if we basically were to decide to ban storage, I think we have to, to understand that this will likely set the standard around how, how these, these systems work, including existing smart accounts, so that I think that will push the ecosystem to like extend those storage contract patterns, and that will be a very sticky default, given that by the, before we can unblock storage, like a big portion of EOAs would already start using this. And um, then a migration of, of a contract that already does use an external storage is kind of infeasible because you'd have to copy over all the existing storage, which is super expensive. So we really basically set long-lasting defaults here. Um, and I mean, I personally think that 
that there might be even be a world where external storage contracts might be the safest pattern also for normal smart accounts because then you you never have to think about conflicting storage access but of course it's more expensive so i think either way it would be really important that whatever choice we make the smart account ecosystem feels confident that it is the right long-term solution otherwise i think we're just really in a bad place got it uh you up Ah, no, no, I guess, I'm, no, it's, uh, I left it, I left my hand okay, uh, raised, uh, sorry. Got it. Uh, Ankur? Uh, yeah, so this is just something which I kind of thought on the fly, please let me know if this doesn't make sense, but what if we allow the user to specify a uh, additional contract, which is, which let's say we call the storage contract while signing. So like, assuming that like we sign the address or, or like the code, apart, apart from that, we allow the user to also specify like a storage contract address at the time of signature and what would happen in the transaction is that whatever stores or s loads are being done it happens in this particular storage contract and if the user for whatever reason wants to switch to another implementation they just produce a new signature and invalidate the last one so this could potentially uh, allow different implementations to use different storage slots while the contract code doesn't really change and if you really just want to switch to another implementation you also just like do a switch to another storage contract as well. Interesting. Um, yeah, uh, let's do draw and then if anyone has thoughts on this. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure about this external storage. What I'm saying is uh, about using storage in account, it is not how much it affects the uh, smart accounts because smart accounts do use their own storage. Uh, the question that I don't think we ask enough is how much it uh, changes the implementation for existing EOAs. Consider all the EOA accounts that never intended to use these new features, but uh, through an upgrade to their wallet, now have some feature, a very strong one uh, imposed on them uh, that allows changing storage, changing behavior. I'm not sure. I think this is where uh, the uh, the storage resolution came from, how it will alter existing uh, EOAs, not how it will help for those who opt in for that. Because for an SCI, you opt in, you sign for an account, and you know that it works like a contract, or at least your wallet knows. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, and yeah, there's a comment by Oscar saying that the storage contract defined in the transaction would be forward compatible. Um, Conrad, did you want to comment on this as well? Uh, yeah, this is actually kind of related to the comment just now, but uh, kind of generally for me, the the biggest problem with just allowing a store um right now in, in seven seven zero two is like um kind of potentially um kind of blocking the way towards like permanent migration um so e even if that's kind of like not included in 7702 right now like i think most most people would agree that eventually the goal would be to to upgrade existing eos to smart accounts but one problem is if, if you can in 7702 now set like storage um even if kind of most accounts adhere to like some sort of like namespace storage if you just kind of like use a single account that doesn't um and set some some for example like storage slot one or something like that then in the future, if you want to permanently upgrade, it might become like unsafe to use like your EOA because it already has stores. So there might be unexpected behavior if you upgrade to a specific contract. Like obviously, like there are best practices we can kind of uh, like do around this. But I, I guess like my fear is that we we kind of I guess like miss something right now, and, and that kind of blocks the permanent upgrade path for EOAs in the future. Got it. Um, okay, and then Yoav says he held the same opinion. To so he agreed uh, to add namespace storage, and then Alkain says that allowing storage isn't going to block migration. Um, I guess. Yeah, it, 
it's not clear to me how we make the call on this at this point. Like it does seem like, um, yeah, if like Solidity allows us uh, to to deal with the namespaced storage issue, um, yeah, and I guess yeah, maybe like client, do you want to explain how you think like even if we have storage, we can still we can do my migrations. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't see these as <clears throat> as problems that are specific to seven seven zero two. And you know, we're kind of talking about the same thing in circles, but this is simply a problem that we have today with smart accounts, and we have to come up with a solution. Solidity, if they are able to support a better storage mapping scheme, like this, is a right the right step. In that solution, there are other possible solutions that have been discussed, like possibly like having some sort of external storage account. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, like if it's okay at the protocol level, then I think it's um, something that we can do. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, no, this is just my opinion. I know that some client teams, other client teams, other client developers feel a bit differently, but I don't see allowing storage today going to impact our ability to do an EOM migration in the future. Okay, so I guess, yeah, does anyone feel strongly we shouldn't move forward with uh, no storage restrictions for now? Um, so that we can actually get started on the implementations and then uh, potentially continue discussing uh, yeah, the issue offline. Um, it does feel like yeah, there's probably like, like yeah, there's on the wallet side, like this is probably not gonna get resolved in the next five minutes of conversation. So if we're going to sidestep solving the storage issue for now, do we have to decide the mechanism for clearing it? In I, protocol or by the, the application? In protocol. It's only really possible in protocol, yeah. But even then with Virco, it's not possible. Why would we clear in protocol? Or what would the mechanism be? Um, so yeah, so to elaborate on Ansgar's question, I'm looking at two different approaches. One where we no op S store ops that we encounter while processing this transaction, as opposed to allowing and then re-clearing it at the end of the transaction. I'm not talking about either of those. I'm just talking about allowing S store to work as it would work under a regular contract account. So updating the storage try. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, okay, another question by Sachin. If we allow storage in the OA, will this result in storage conflict when the OA uses different implementations with different transactions? Yeah, I mean, this is again, the same thing that we've been discussing, but it's also equivalent to the problem that we have today, where if you're using Gnosis Safe and then you switch to another smart contract wallet, you have a conflict, a potential conflict of storage elements. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's move forward with uh, storage for now. Um, and again, yeah, keep discussing um, async. Uh, and then, like client, you have the proxy pattern. Is this, um, basically, this is independent of storage, right? Like even if, I wouldn't say it's perfectly independent of storage yeah. because I think there is a, a distinction between the problem of allowing multiple implementations of code interacting with the storage of the same account 
Um, in 7702, it's possible to, like Felix said, delegate to code off chain. And this is something that it's kind of possible. You could create a system that allows you to do this off chain delegation thing in a smart contract wall, but no one does it because it's very roundabout and feels weird. But under 7702, it's a lot more natural to have your seed phrase in multiple EOA wallets and have them have their own proxies or their own wallet implementations that they sign over. And so I think that in in the 7702 case, it's a bit more, it's more likely that we will end up in a situation where the user has signed or the user has delegated to multiple pieces of code interacting with the storage. Whereas for smart contract walls today, it's a bit less likely because we don't, we don't have this off chain delegation mechanism. Typically you change the proxy target in your account. This is a very clear process. This is something you're interacting with on chain and then you just have to send a transaction. So that leads into this proxy discussion. There are numerous things to discuss about it, but one way to bring 7702 in line with how EOA wallets are, sorry, yeah, bring 7702 in line with how the smart contract wallets are working with delegation is to have one proxy contract that is allowed in protocol. And I think that Felix was the first to pr propose this, but suppose in this hypothetical world, we come up with a proxy smart contract. I've come up with some sort of example to give you a rough idea of what, what I would be thinking about. But suppose we have this one proxy contract, it's deployed on chain. And in 7702, we say that you can only delegate to the address of this proxy contract that we have decided upon. And this is future compatible if we want to later allow people to delegate to other pieces of code. But in the beginning, we start with this more fixed restriction saying you can only delegate to this proxy code. Now you don't really have the situation that we could have today with 7702, where I have my EOA seed in multiple wallets. Those wallets are using different proxies or different wallet implementations. In this world, they would have all signed the exact same 7702 message, and it's really just the on-chain storage that affects what code implementation is running. So I think this addresses that, that issue of having off-chain delegation with 7702, as well as trying to minimize uh, the number of like floating around authorizations that a user might have. You can always look on chain to see what delegate target of the proxy is, and then you can understand what uh, code will be executing in that account. So that's just the idea. I think Onscar is saying he doesn't like the one, the enshrined in protocol version. I'm curious what other people think. I'm also generally very hesitant to enshrine a specific smart contract in the protocol, but it is an option. And I do think that it addresses some of the concerns that we have around storage. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hey, yeah, so I was saying, uh, Anzar was saying he uh, doesn't like a, a one proxy contract because um, <clears throat> he, he'd rather let uh, wallets do the whitelisting on that. And, you know, I've I've been a big proponent of like trust the wallets to be safe. But I think that this could actually be a bit of a foot gun because a user could have SRPs in multiple uh, wallet implementations. They might not be aware of uh, 7702 signatures that other wallets had signed. Um, and so you could have conflicting 7702 messages floating around, which would expose that user to this kind of bundler griefing attack that we're talking about. There'd be very little a wallet developer could do about it. Um, so this isn't uh, about ensuring that wallets are making safe decisions. Uh, this is about making sure that it's even possible to have uh, safety for the user and the user apps they uh, sign. It's, uh, there's a question. What's an SRPS? Oh my gosh, uh, secret recovery phrase. It's uh, we started adopting it instead of a seed phrase because uh, seed phrase was not communicating the uh, need to hide and keep secret the uh, the private keys to uh, normal users. 
there's a, a user research thing. Obviously, I don't need to use that term in this group, but it is a force of habit. Thanks. Um, Ansgar? Yeah, I would just say I'm, I'm open to this idea of, of, of this kind of enshrined proxy, but I think if we actually lean this way, then there's at least a case to be made to like look into a bit more whether we can just more fundamentally change 7702 to, to basically account for this, because it seems overkill to have this general purpose delegation mechanism and then restricted to a single delegation target. Um, I mean, of course, if we very clearly expect in the future to completely remove this restriction, that would be a different thing. But to me, it's not obvious that we would. It seems like we would probably stick with this forever. And then at that point, it might be better to to just directly have that behavior enshrined at a more fundamental level at the EIP. With the only counter argument that I can see is that this way, basically, it kind of maybe most closely matches the pattern of existing smart accounts. But But it still seems like... Because also, for example, there's extra cost involved because now you have to like first load that proxy contract anew in every transaction, and then you have to basically load, load, load the target. So it's, it makes everything more expensive as well. Yeah, I think maybe zooming out a little bit to understand why is this even proposed? What exactly is the solving? Like, what is the fundamental problem that we're trying to address? Uh, with the the enshrine proxy proposal and to me it's about putting on chain in a standardized way what code is executing in the context of the account and so if we think about it more from this direction we can think what is the right what what are the other what are alternatives what would the right way to to do this would be because we're sort of constrained in many ways with what we can do in the protocol today. Uh, and that's like especially true when it comes to modifying the account structure in the state try, because I think the right way, a better way to do this would to have the auth tuple update a field in the user's account that could say this, uh, this contract has delegated to this code and it would only hydrate the code in that account in certain scenarios like a 7702 uh, transaction. And that way, if you have your seed, your SRP in multiple different wallets, that wallet can see on chain that you've already delegated to some different code and it will minimize the chances of you having many sign, uh, many of these signed delegate messages. There would need to be some replay protection in there so that you can't um, just keep updating the code you delegated to. But I think that that's like the nice thing. And we've sort of circumvented that a bit with this enshrined proxy by instead of having it on chain, what code you're going to execute, we just decide for everybody, this is the proxy code that your account will execute. So you can't sign multiple 7702 messages from different wallets. Um, you can only sign one and then the target is in the account storage. With that said, I don't know if anyone has other ideas about how we could address the problem of mini wallets with your seed phrase not seeing what you've delegated to. Uh, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking if we need to um, extend the um, account scheme to include this new field, uh, authorized code or whatnot, we can do it with Velco. How so? Well, Verkle has a number of storage elements that's loaded with the account header. Oh, right. Oh, right, right, so right, right, right. Okay. I think that it's going to be much easier to put stuff into those storage slots and give meaning to them. Not storage slots, they're like protocol slots. Um, yeah, so Verkle will be a big revamp of everything. So it's probably rather easy to to change that bit as well to add this new feature uh togard has a question about a partially enshrined contract i'm not sure what partially enshrined is Just uh, a, a very bare bones uh, 
implementation, um, a, a proxy that's like barely even a proxy, um, but that still allows like arbitrarily customizable uh, code to be added in in the transaction type. So you would first hit the enshrined contract and then the enshrined contract would just do a handful of you know safety checks. Uh, but then it would call into the uh, EOA's authorized code as defined in the transaction. Just, just an idea. Um, and there's two ideas by Vitalik. One is having the code at address plus one being the EOA's backup code. Um, and then having some little two temporary flip on the backup code. Um, and then add an EOF version for this account 7702 code is at address X. Um, both of which are, I guess, bigger design changes to the EIP. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any thoughts, comments? Like, it does seem, I guess, like there are um, still like some quite significant uh, design questions to discuss. And I guess I'm trying to figure out what's the right way to square this with actually wanting this to ship in the next fork so that users get the benefit from it. Um, for, I guess, the wallet folks on the call who aren't uh, as familiar with the uh, L1 uh, development process. Like if we want to actually ship this to the next hard fork, we probably need to get started working on it in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm trying to balance like how much do we want to explore this design space and um, what's the best way to do that with is there like a minimal version of this EIP we can start working on um, so that there's at least a chance it gets into the next hard fork and uh, that we don't basically uh, end up with a design when um, we're, we're ready to, to start shipping things. Um, so yeah, I don't know if maybe anyone on the L1 team has a, uh, an idea for like, what's the right next step from here to yeah keep this moving forward, but also make sure we get to explore the yeah potential changes to the spec. I think my very biased thought is to pretty much merge the PR as it is. So that's without the storage restrictions. It's without an enshrined proxy. And it has the optional revocation mechanisms. And we go from there. Because I think ultimately the client teams are probably going to implement this and have comments and questions. And in general, you know, wallet, the wallet teams probably want the most permissive systems possible and the client teams are going to want less permissive systems. So it's just, we need to spend some time working on it and seeing what we can, what kind of compromise we can get to. Okay. Uh, Andrew. Uh, yeah, one, uh, uh, I, uh, I am in favor of merging PR 8561. Just one uh, small technical comment. Um, we need probably to distinguish between null nonce and zero nonce. And I suggest, uh, well, one way to do it is just to encode non null nonce as an empty RLP list because, um, because zero nonce will be encoded as an empty string. Just a technicality. Okay. Yeah, I assume we can make that change. Um, okay, so yeah, let's move forward with the PR. We can discuss that on Encore Devs next week, but it seems extremely likely that um, teams will just want to implement that and add it to DevNet 1. Um, and then is it worth basically scheduling another one of these breakouts either two or four weeks from now um, so that uh, once teams have started uh, working on it, uh, we can potentially um, yeah, have another deeper conversation and also have all the conversations on like the storage and the potential spec change happen in parallel. Um, 
yeah, my sense is like there'll probably be more to discuss than like you know what we can do in like five ten minutes on all core devs. So um, yeah, the people feel like two weeks, four weeks from now makes sense for a breakout. Um, and then on Scar last game for weekly. Uh, does anyone want to do weekly? So one, okay, yeah, I guess one small challenge with weekly, it's not a huge deal, but there is like the roll call uh, at this time every uh, few weeks. But um, yeah, I would, yeah, I guess, okay. So maybe let's do this. Let's do bi-weekly. And then we also have awkward devs uh, for, yeah. Yeah, uh, L1 EL teams to like discuss this. So um, yeah, let's start with bi-weekly and see if, if we need more. Um, I'll just do this time two weeks from now, so June twelfth. Um, I think by then, um, by then, what we can do is um, figure out the um, yeah, figure out. Oh, sorry, the protocol calendar is wrong. Um, okay, so roll call is two weeks from now. So then, okay, because there's like a lot of spec changes now. Let's do another call before next Thursday's all core dev. So like a week from now see uh how things go on awkward devs and um yeah take it from there to potentially have like another call two weeks or a week after that if there's more changes but the people feel like a week from now um yeah we'll have more stuff to discuss if not we can also do three weeks so Any strong preference? It's not okay. I'll just pull on the okay next week. Then biweekly seems reasonable. Uh, okay, let's do that. Ansgar, um, we still have like ten minutes here. So, is there anything else that people wanted to discuss and that we didn't get to today? Yeah, Elliot, Elias. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I had one question that I asked on the on the EIP, which was about using Ketchak as a way to, I don't know, there was a Ketchak magic on the transformation type. And I suggested that using Ketchak was uh, detrimental to ZKVMs. And I was wondering why we need um, a Ketchak in there. Which use of Ketchak do you have in mind? Um, let me get it. But I think in the... Transaction it's type. for computing the SIG hash. I see. I mean, I feel like that's like a broader issue, right? Because right now, basically all of the uh, transaction types use Kachak for computing the uh, SIG hash. And so if we want to move past that, then it feels like it makes the most sense to do that as part of uh, the broader move toward SSCing the, transac the uh, transaction list. But okay, yeah, I I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess like one fair critique would be that uh, like if someone wants to pull ahead the uh, SSC features in their uh, like ZK EVM layer two because that uh, like re reduces their vulnerability to catch act DOS, then they'll have uh, like incompatible seven seven zero two formats, and so. 7702 on every chain would not would not be something that exists. But I mean, I feel like ultimately that sort of thing is uh, inevitable and like eventually we're going to get to a world where like if he wants to do things on quote every chain, then uh, like not every chain is even going to be a chain that supports SecP. Um, I'm on. Yeah, my uh, comment here is about something else. Um, it was uh, I just wanted to propose that um, the wallet uh, developers uh, gather and agree on an ARC format for the proxy that they want to whitelist on the wallet side um, instead of uh, enshrining that in protocol. Um, I, I'm still leaning toward maximum flexibility when it comes to the implementation. 
of the contract. Thanks. Um, Ansgar? Yeah, so um, I mentioned in, in my summary in the beginning, the kind of the desire to also start work on basically like a document with best practices and recommendations and possibly even things we kind of want to uh, enforce on the social layer and around wallet behavior. And I'm just wondering what would be the best format to start making progress on this? I know that we have these all wallet devs calls. Is that, would that be a good place? Is there a different place? Like, uh, I just, I just, I just worry that basically if we start too late, it might, it, it might just take time to figure these things out. Can we have this as an ERC as well? It's kind of weird. No, I don't know if there's any wallet specific ERCs. Um, yeah, I guess it's maybe like we can start working on the best practices and then we can figure out where we store it uh, long term. Um, so I guess for okay, so for next week's call, um, the three things that would be nice is one. Um, if we want to explore these different spec uh, changes that Metallic proposed, um, to having the uh, ERC proxy that uh, people sort of uh, yeah can 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 agree on, and then three, uh, getting some progress on the best practices document. Anything else people feel we need to get done before next week? And anything else uh, anyone wants to discuss before we wrap up? Great, sweet. Well, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, I'll post the recording. Oh, who will be working on the best practice doc? Um, and I guess same question for the ERC. Like I think if people, okay, Ansgar will be working on the best practice docs. Um, on the ERC, Matt had a draft. Um, does anyone from the wallet side wants okay? Uh, want to help? Okay, uh, Richard, uh, wants to help. Okay, and then I guess the best channel, uh, to so we, we have like uh, each magicians for the EIP, but we also have the uh, do we we have an a channel yeah we have the future eoa channel in the r d discord um so we can use that as well to coordinate um yeah right anything else okay thanks everyone talk to you all soon thank you see ya